got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and I told him like I, I literally studied type 2 diabetes as my PhD like I know it can be reversed you just have to be disciplined enough to really fix your nutrition nutrition is always number one right anything that you want to do weight loss or, or muscle gain comes from the nutrition and the better in shape you get the harder it is to continue to be in more shape so while I'm a big fan of what ketosis can do I also know what the importance of like what carbs can do for my training in this episode we have Tyler Holt who has been a trainer and coach for 14 years he used to compete in bodybuilding competitions got his pro card in 2014 and then got into fitness modeling he has traveled all over the world for photo shoots as well as be part of the bodybuilding.com and muscle farm family Started his own gym in 2015, he started his entrepreneurial journey, journey and has continued to develop himself and his business over the years. And now he has switched from his normal bodybuilding style to endurance events. Started last year, he did a triathlon and a marathon. He found a lot of joy in the challenge that endurance has brought him. And when he started working out, he was only 140 pounds soaking wet and went into bodybuilding. And now he considers himself a hybrid athlete trying to be as optimal of a human being as possible. In this episode, we talked about bodybuilding, key factors that determine muscle building and weight loss, best sources of proteins and the different guidelines as well as top supplements that Tyler would recommend. Stay tuned and enjoy this episode. Hey, we have Tyler Holt on the HVMN podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. Welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. I'm glad to be on. Yeah. And, and where are you based, Tyler? I am in Colorado, um, in Centennial, Colorado. And, and a lot of, uh, as far as I know, I mean, I, I've been to Colorado only a couple of times for like events. I know a lot of people there are very much into biohacking, into their health and fitness uh, routines and also outdoors. So I think that's a great place to be, huh? Yeah, Colorado is a super fit state. Um, then, you know, things to do all, all times of year here from summer to winter. And uh, it's just a very, very active and fit community. I love it. I just thought of something. I should make a content on like comparing the fitness levels between states and then, you know, go into the analysis of why the numbers are that, that like that. Yeah, you That'll should. Be interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. I know Colorado is usually ranked. So uh, ranked one of the top uh, or the most fit state, um, but it might have it might have been beat by another state recently. But I know most of the time it's if, if not the first one, definitely in the top three. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting. I think people people would definitely be interested to know, okay, you know, certain states, even though we're all in the same country, uh, perform better in health and fitness, whereas the others perform worse. And why is that? Is that does that have anything to do with culture, with ethnic groups, with genetics, or with just lifestyle choices, right? So um, speaking of which, you know, you've got quite a lot of um, credibility to you you've got more than half a million followers on, on instagram you share a lot of information and knowledge around training and, and nutrition so why don't you share a bit of your background with us uh, so that the audience get to know you a little bit more yeah absolutely yeah i've been um in the in, in the fitness industry for i've been a coach for going on a coach and a trainer for going on 14 years so i've been in this industry since i was 19 years old um you know, and it, when I started, I was a very, very skinny guy when I first started. I uh, was 140 pounds coming out of high school, was a basketball player my whole life. <clears throat> and then, you know, I did, I did not continue to play basketball in uh, college. So I really needed something to do. And I had always had issues with how skinny I was, you know, dealing with you just getting picked on and the little bit of bullying, you know, just because of how skinny I was, which is really sick of that. So, um, since I wasn't playing basketball, I thought, well, I'm going to just go try to get big. I didn't have any idea that that would turn into what everything has turned into now. I just know I hated how I looked and I just wanted to be big and have some muscles on me. So I um, actually hired a trainer and the just started working out, putting on some size. And then, you know, the trainer was like, hey, have you ever thought about doing a, uh, a competition, bodybuilding competition or physique competition? And I had I was like, no, but um, I was like, I'll try it. So I did my first one, took third place in my first one and then continued training after that. And uh, in 2014, I ended up getting my pro card and um, things just kind of took off from there. From there, I got into fitness modeling 
and throughout all this, I had um, uh, ended up just, I was a personal trainer and then I, I left the corporate gym, started my own personal training company um, and then left the corporate gym, was renting space out of another gym. Things went really south with that thing. And I, uh, you know, just one day I it called up one of my clients and I was like, hey, I just need you to find me a building. I'm gonna, just going to do this myself. So while just building myself with within the fitness industry, I was also just building myself as an entrepreneur and, you know, had had no game plan, didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I needed to, I was in a spot where I needed to open up my own gym and I just, I did that. And then, so got into the fitness modeling and um, was working with uh, Muscle Farm, working with bodybuilding.com, doing a lot of campaign work uh, for them, was traveling all over to expos around the country, you know, being a, being just a part of those. And um, after that, so 2020 comes around, I get, or, you know, 2020 was 2020 for everybody, right? So uh, while all these other gyms and everything are shutting down, I, had, I needed to figure out a way to keep mine alive. So I had put all that aside and my focus went into just making sure that my gym was able to survive. And so, um, you know, but then I realized that I wasn't really like into the, the bodybuilding and I didn't want to do the bodybuilding anymore. I didn't want to do the fitness modeling anymore. And I kind of just felt a, a lull in what I was doing. I was kind of just going through the motions in the gym. Didn't, just didn't feel like I had much of a purpose. And then I, uh, you know, one of my clients, uh, challenged me to do a triathlon with him and, um, I had never done anything endurance based ever before other than some stairmaster doing cardio for my bodybuilding competitions or whatever. But, and, uh, you know, I was like, you know what, that's, I've never done anything like that before. That's a new challenge. I was like, let's go for it. And, um, I actually fell in love with just that, that process of, I didn't know how to swim. So I had to learn how to swim first of all. Um, and then I had eight weeks to do all this. So, um, learned how to swim. Everybody knows how to run, but learning about running is different. Same with biking. Right. And um, so really just had to challenge myself to learn three new things and just put myself in that situation. And, you know, the endurance side of things really where if you had asked me 10 years ago if I'd be doing any of that, I would have I would have laughed at you. But I actually really started to enjoy the process and enjoy the endurance work. It was new and challenging for me. And. Uh, it's just a great way to continue to push myself and <clears throat> give me a new sense of purpose and a new goal to reach for. So did the triathlon a little bit later, I did uh, a marathon and um, you know, this year I've got, you know, a list of uh, events that I'm going to be doing as well that are endurance based. And so really just found a new kind of drive and passion within what I wanted to do for myself. Yeah. I mean, Hey, you never know what life throws at you. Right. And I think, you know, one really obvious point that you you didn't emphasize emphasize from your story that I I could notice is the persistence and resilience that you brought from all the experience and and struggles that you've gone through to learn something completely new to throw yourself into a challenge that you would have never thought you would do and I I re really respect you for that because um myself you know I think a lot of people can relate they they often get pushed and pulled into areas that they they had no idea they could do um and they they pushed through and then they became a better person and and, and became more knowledgeable as a result so kudos to you um fitness modeling is it as glamorous as people make up to be um you know it's it was fun i, I did have a lot of fun the opportunities i got um i was on a, a romance cover uh, romance novel cover, uh, been in a couple calendars. Uh, I've worked with some big name photographers and, and they're all, it's all very different. And, it, you know, there's a lot of work that just goes into a couple photos and videos and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's really like the process of being in a, <clears throat> in a photo shoot is not, it's nothing that exciting, right? You're just, you're sitting there and they're like flex here, flex here. And you're just holding that. So it's not like it's, it's the, the after production and like what all gets done and then they show all this stuff and you're like, wow, that's cool. But you know, the traveling was awesome. Um, but the yeah. photo shoots themselves, uh, very boring. 
<laughs> so, so you identify yourself as a, a hybrid athlete now. So this, you know, from what I'm understanding, does the hybrid athlete refer refer to you having done bodybuilding and then now you're into endurance? So hence, you're good at both strength and endurance. Is that is that correct? My understanding. Es- essentially, yeah. I and I think you know, there's 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 a difference between. Um, like I, I view a hybrid athlete as someone who can go lift a lot of weight or do something of that sort, and then be able to turn around and go do some type of endurance aspect of it and how to combine both of those CrossFit athletes are phenomenal, uh, examples of that, right? They have to lift heavy weight and they have to have really good endurance for things. Right. And so, you know, if I want to be able to deadlift, um, 500 pounds, but then also be able to turn around and go to and go run a marathon that itself that is a hybrid training those are two trainings that do not necessarily help each other right me training to run a marathon does sure as hell doesn't allow me to deadlift 500 pounds right that doesn't help me deadlift 500 pounds and me deadlifting 500 pounds does not give me the endurance to go run a marathon so it is taking two you know contradicting styles of training and putting them together for me, just making myself a, a, a for, it, my whole goal was to just optimize myself and make myself as complete of an athlete as possible and be able to do all things. I love to be able to be at a point to where whatever event is coming up, you give me eight weeks and I'll be fully ready for it. So if I need to, if I have a run coming up, okay, cool. Give me eight weeks where I can put a little more focus into the running. I'll be ready for that. Or, um, yeah, I'm doing the triple bypass, uh, this year, which I don't know if you heard of that, but it's a bike ride, um, 118 miles over 10,000 feet of elevation gain over three mountain passes here in Colorado. And so I want to be at a point where I can, you know, the, the, that's coming up. Okay. Eight weeks. Now I switch my focus into biking, right. Or, but in, in all the meantime, focusing on my strength training so that I can still maintain all my lean muscle mass, right. I put a lot of time into building my frame to from 140 pounds to 220 pounds. I don't want to lose all that muscle. So but I want to be that muscle to be useful. And I want it to be able to do the work that I need it to do in order to complete these events. That that was actually my next question. Um, because you switched from bodybuilding to more endurance based, I was wondering if you did any work to change your body composition. Because as you know, you know, the lighter you are, probably you'll be able to do more endurance work versus when you're heavier and more muscle mass and less fat. Um, and then obviously also the um, ability to tap into the fat storage while you're doing endurance as well. So having very low body fat as you as a bodybuilder would, it would definitely be detrimental um, to endurance. So so how did you, what did you do and, and how did you uh, manage to adapt to that? Yeah. And, and so when I did my, the triathlon was my first endurance based event ever. And I, I had a goal that I wanted to, I did not want to lose. I wanted to keep as much lean muscle mass as possible, but I wanted to at least be respectable, have a respectable time in that kind of stuff. My goal with the endurance stuff is not to be the best in the world at that, because I do understand that me carrying as much, as much muscle on my frame as I do makes that highly, right? I'm not, I'm not Kipchoge. I'm not running a, a, a two hour marathon by any means. Um, and I'm definitely not running a triathlon as fast as these world champion Ironman people are, uh, because I have so much muscle on my frame, but I wanted to get away from that status quo that you, if you want to be endurance based, you have to be, you have to have a skinny frame, right? I want to show that you can have muscle and you can have the endurance of that. And so if it means that, you know, and if for me, if I'm holding on to as much muscle as possible, and it means that I'm just I'm just not the fastest marathon runner. I'm not the fastest triathlete. I'm okay with that as long as I can still complete everything and have a respectable time. Then I'm totally fine with being able to maintain more muscle, and and just be and be pretty good at the endurance stuff. I I didn't now if suddenly I had something in my mind that triggered and it was like I want to win the Boston Marathon or whatever, right? I would definitely have to make some sacrifices to the amount of muscle that I have on and the type of training that I do in order to get to that level. So for me, it was just kind of finding a balance of where I could maintain my muscle mass, keep building my strength, but then also be able to be an above average endurance athlete. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, and I think you, you gave a good example as well. A lot of CrossFitters, um, they are, you know, very strong. They've got good muscle mass, but at the same time, uh, they can go for a good run and, and come with a respectable time as well. So I think that's certainly um, achievable. Uh, it really falls down to your nutrition and training. So in terms of bodybuilding, I've always wondered this, right? Like, how does one get into bodybuilding? Does one just decide, okay, I'm going to go into bodybuilding, get a coach, and then that's it? Or is there a certain process? Um, you know, let, let's get behind the scenes of a bodybuilder. How does one start? How does one go through it? And all the, all the you know, stuff that people don't know. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's as simple as somebody deciding that they want to uh, run a marathon, right? Um, if you know what you're doing, great. Otherwise, you probably need to hire a coach. Um, so, and, and, and the coach's job is to assess where you are and what we need to do to get you where you need to be. And you never know how you're going to do until you actually go do something, right? I didn't know how my first competition was going to turn out until I just went and did the first competition, right? Now, the guidance of my coach at the time, obviously, you said you need to have some more size on you before you step on stage. So once I put enough size on, we're like, okay, let's go step on stage. And let's see, let's see what happens, right. And so because you never you read, you never know where you are until you test where you are. So um, I always consider your first like your first show or your first race or whatever is is a, a feeler, a tester, right to see where you stack up and what you need to do to improve, right? Because we don't know until we actually put that to the test. So, you know, bodybuilding, hired my coach, um, put on all the muscles, did all the things, all the supplements, all the nutrition, right? You go and, and then you just sign up for a show. You go on stage, you do your thing, you get the feedback from the coaches and obviously your placing tells you kind of where you are. And then you take a step back and you regain plan from there for what you want to do going into the next show. So very similar to how you would approach, you know, any, any other endurance event or whatever, right. You go, you perform, you see how you perform, you take a step back, you regain plan, you adjust and you go forward and you try to be better on that next one. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so do you still train people right now or are you just running the gym or, uh, you know, do you have any clients at all? Yeah, I still train people. Uh, I still train people full time. Yeah. And run the gym. Nice. So sh can you share with us some stories of uh, the biggest challenges that you've you've faced with your clients? And, you know, give us some common problems that people have faced? And, and how did you overcome those? I think, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years. And I, I think there's a handful of things that are very consistent. One, people don't do things for the right reason. Um, and, and I'll expand on that first. A lot of people want to lose weight, right? A ton of people want to lose weight, be, be more, be more healthy, yeah. whatever that means for them, put on muscle. And so many times, strangely enough, it is not for themselves. It's for somebody else, right? I want to do this so I can be healthier for my kids, or I want to do this because my husband said I'm fat or, you know, whatever the reason might be. And as unfortunate as it is, and as much as you would like to think that that kids or your husband or whatever should be a driving factor in you doing something, it is it is never enough until the individual wants to truly do that for themselves. And, you know, I'll, I'll meet with people and they're like, oh, I want to do this because of my kids. And I'll, and I'll straight up tell them that's not enough. And the look, the look on their face when I say that, it, you know, it's they're just completely taken aback. Like, what are you telling me? My kids aren't important enough? No, no, I'm not saying your kids are not important. They are very important. And, and you should want to be, but you should want to be a healthier person for you so that you can be a better parent for them, right? So that you can be there for them at their sporting events, play with them, whatever it is. So I think a lot of times, one of the biggest things we come across is people just are doing things for the wrong reason and and they don't have whatever in their head has not clicked yet that it needs to be for themselves and so a lot of people use excuses for different things like oh i'm going to do it for this and i'm going to do it for this but every single time what we see is when people are doing it for something that is not for themselves it just doesn't work long term until they can find it in themselves to be like i need to do this for me and then once that clicks everything is good 
everything is good. Things work and they do all the work that's that's required. The second thing, and I'm I'm big on this with my clients, and I push my clients to um I just say do hard things. That's a very broad spectrum of things, right? But so many people just kind of go through like, you know, it, f- showing people what they can actually do is part of the most is is probably the most exciting part of my job. And the part that I enjoy the most is showing people that they can do more than they ever knew that they could do. Me having more confidence in this person and what they can do than they even have in themselves until they realize, oh, I can do all this. And that just changes people's lives. That alone is what changes people's lives, right? It's, you know, creating weight loss out of people that changes their life, you know, all that kind of stuff. But showing people how powerful they truly are, that is what changes people's lives in in all aspects, in themselves, in how they handle their relationships as a, as a parent, at their job, whatever it is, being able to, to put people in uncomfortable situations and have them overcome those situations is what changes their life. And so part of my programming and what I always push my clients to do is, hey, let's, you know, um, I'm doing a um, a trail half marathon here in April and just all my clients, I'm like, hey, you're doing this. (laughs) You know, it's like a lot of times it's not even an option anymore. I'm like, hey, you're going to do this. You don't have anything planned. You don't have anything hard, you know, any events that you're doing in the future. Um, so you're going to do this. And some of them are like, Oh, I can't do that. And then some, some of them are totally on board. Some of them are down for whatever. Some are very like, Oh, I, I don't think I can do that. And so that is an opportunity for me to be like, to show them, yes, you can. Here's a, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to do this. Da 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 da, And force them to be uncomfortable and force them to overcome these situations that they be- themselves believe that they can't do. And the result from that, the outcome and how they feel about themselves and how they feel about themselves is exactly why I do what I do still. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually saw that somewhere on social media a couple of weeks ago, like do hard things so that when times gets tough, you know how to handle these hard things and hard moments. I saw that a couple of weeks ago and it really resonated with me. Um, having lived in multiple countries, having having to live alone, away from family and friends, studying abroad, um, adapting to a foreign environment, foreign language, foreign community. You know, it wasn't easy to begin with, but before I knew it, it became easy because I've done it so many times. I don't even think about it. In fact, if anything, I look forward to every time I'm about to move to a new country or move, make a new move because it's the unknown that people are afraid of. But because I've done it so many times, I know that the unknown also brings excitement and it brings opportunities. And with that, it it allows me to grow and learn more about myself as well as um, the external factors with people around me. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great advice. Um, and I think the very powerful thing is doing it for yourself. Um, I can share my story about me giving up smoking. I was smoking for seven years and I've tried giving up like a couple of times before. Um, you know, a lot of my friends are like, oh, you know, you're going to get cancer, you're going to die, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, you know, we're all going to die, you know, let us like live our lives or whatever. You know, what people usually go into the defensive, they're like, oh, let us live our lives and everyone's going to die. You know, I'll eat whatever I want. I'll do whatever I want. And not until I realized, you know, when I started studying about biotechnology, genetics, learning about mutations of the genes and learning how cancer um, manifests, that I realized if I do not stop, I am a hypocrite by knowing this knowledge and yet do nothing about my health. And that was when I decided to do it for myself. I'm not doing it for my parents. I'm not doing it for my friends. I'm not doing it for anyone else, but for myself. And I went cold turkey um, and I I, I haven't smoked since. Um, Has been, what, God, uh, 16 years now. So it's been a while. I love it. I love it. That's that's but and that's just goes to what I said, right? Everybody says, oh, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. But it wasn't until you were like, oh, I need to do this that that triggered in your head. Right. And so that's, that's, I love that you came to that conclusion and you did that for yourself, man. That is awesome. 
Yeah, no, um, I, I, I definitely that was the point as well because after that, you know, a lot of my friends was like, "Oh, can you talk to my my husband? Can you talk to my my friend who is still smoking? Like, you've gone through this. Can you like convince them to stop?" I was like, "No, I can't. No one can convince them to stop unless they themselves want to stop. If they want to stop." And they are seeking help or they're seeking advice. I'm more than happy to be that person to to give whatever knowledge, whatever experience I've come across and I've gone through with them. But until then, there is no way for me to sit down and say, "Hey, you know, your wife, your husband told me that you should stop, and and here I am trying to make you stop." No, it it it's, doesn't work that way. It's just not enough. Like you may try it for a few days. Like I tried many times with my cousin, um, you know, who was a smoker, and um, you know, he he got diagnosed with type two diabetes. And I told him like I I literally studied type two diabetes as my PhD. Like I I know it can be reversed. You just have to be disciplined enough to really fix your nutrition. And you know, like he's an active person. Great, but what you eat it it matters a lot, and it, it just it's disappointing. Yes, when when you see that you know your loved ones are not really doing anything to help themselves or their health, but at the same time, like I I'm still looking for the opportunity to light the light bulb in his head, saying that hey, you're not doing this for me, you're doing this for you, and as a result, as you said. Because of that, you can be a better father. You can be a better husband. You can be a better cousin.、Um, exactly. So, I yeah, hope、exactly. he he hears this and he knows that I love him. Yeah, that's and you know what? That's sometimes that's、um, not even sometimes. Most of the time, that's really all you can do, right? Is just try to be one like yourself. Be 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 a a role model. Be an an image of exactly what that means to to do that, right? And then and just and just support and you know it's. It's one thing to like nag and peer pressure and all that kind of stuff. It's another to just be a piece of support that's like, hey, you know, exactly like you said, hey, you know, I'm gonna just plop this in your head here. I'm gonna plop this in your head here, and then hopefully over time, something clicks. Yeah, exactly.、Um, I always believe as well. You can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves. So that's always the 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 principle that I follow.、Um, you know, I'll always. Go out of my way if somebody really needs help and nobody was there. But if I notice that they are just there and they're not really helping themselves, then you know that's no point. It's just nope, a waste of effort. A waste of effort, waste of energy. So you can't do much.、Um, yeah, exactly. So、um, as you were saying earlier, you know, a lot of people come to you because they want to lose、uh, fat, they want to lose weight, they want to be healthier. So what are the key factors in building muscle and losing fat? Um, so you know, nutrition is always number one. Nutrition changes everything. I know this is a very general question as well. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, nutrition is nutrition is always number one, right? Anything that you want to do, weight loss or or muscle gain, comes from the nutrition. And honestly, you know, with clients, I have clients that will are wanting to put muscle on. I have clients that want to lose the weight, and they're training in the gym. It's just about the same, give or take some cardio or whatever that might be. But it's the nutrition that really sets these things apart, right?、Um, I am always, always an advocate for a high protein diet, first and foremost. So you know, there's there's a lot of levels that people come in wondering about nutrition. From somebody who just who is coming in and knows nothing about it, okay, we're going to focus on two things. We're going to focus on your overall caloric intake, and we're just going to focus on protein. Two things, right? There's Not a lot of reason to say, okay, here's your calories, here's your、uh, your protein, your fats, your carbs, your fiber,、um, this much water, yada yada. Like, if you overwhelm people, they don't end up doing things. So many, many times when people come in, it's first thing we're going to focus on what your calorie mark needs to be, and what your pro- grams of protein need to be, and then, you know, we'll we'll work on implementing other things from there. But When they focus on just the calories and the protein, typically things fall in line with where they need to be. And then, if there's anything else, the the better in shape you get, the harder it is to continue to be in more shape. So then we get down to the nitty gritty details, you know, the fats, the carbs, the fiber, the timing of these nutrients, all that kind of stuff. 
but we we worry about that later on when when we need to there's at, at the beginning for most people they can focus on those two things still make a ton of progress and then you piece by piece it from there I get to interview all these doctors, scientists, and cool people in this health and fitness industry, all made possible because of this podcast that is funded by the company I work for, which is Health Via Modern Nutrition or HVMN. And it is not that they pay me to do this, but I genuinely love and believe in the product Ketone IQ. I use it every day before my podcast, before my workout, or even after my workout for recovery. There hasn't been a single supplement that can give me such a drastic change in subjective feel within minutes as much as Ketone IQ has. For those of you who do not know me, I'm from Malaysia, I got my PhD from the UK, and my passion is in science and chronic diseases, and I believe it is all about transparency, scientific integrity, and about sharing with everyone so that everyone can benefit from it. And if you like this content and our work, please do support us by liking, leaving a review, or sharing with your friends and families, or even buying a shot of Ketone IQ at any Sprouts nationwide in the US, and the first shot is on us. Just scan the QR code and you'll get your money back for your first shot. You can also use the code HVMNPOD20, that is HVMNPOD20, and get 20% off your first purchase at the HVMN website. Uh, what about training? So what what are, um, you know, are they tailored and personalized to, to different clients or are they uh, specific go-to regimes that you would go to for people who are, you know, trying to gain muscle and lose fat? Uh, most definitely tailored for, for each client. Everybody's different. Everybody's got um, mobility limitations of in past injuries, current injuries, uh, you know, just whatever kind of limitations that people have. Some people are brand new. Some people were high school, college athletes, and some people have been lifting for the past 20 years of their life, you know, so everybody's different. So I definitely have a, um, you know, depending on what the person's goal is, I have a general layout, but everything all, all the time gets customized towards that person. You know, somebody who wants to gain muscle, you know, let's, let's go back to the bodybuilding, right? Some people just have naturally dominant chest or legs or back or whatever, but lag in a couple of different areas. So I, you know, those programs need to be tailored towards, okay, we're going to build this up with you. Right. And same with a person who is wanting to lose weight. Right. Um, they might be, they might be strong and their cardio is terrible. So, okay, we need to tailor what we, what we need to do to work best for this, this person. Right. Uh, and everything is also progression as well. So what somebody might, you know, 80% of your, of your max is, is obviously different for, for each person. But in that sense, right, there's, if we're looking at a strength progression, let's say, you know, we, we take what a, what a max weight is. And then we, you know, strength itself, if we just progress that, that can be, if somebody wants to, is looking to put on size and somebody's looking to lose weight, the strength progressions, those can be pretty similar. But the lifts that we do, the way that we do things, and the amount of volume slash intensity that we do those at always vary. Nice. So let's go back to you know the nutrition that you were um, talking about earlier a little bit. What are the best source of proteins? And how much protein should one take per meal or even per day? Because you know there are a lot of studies that says you shouldn't take more than 25 to 50 grams of protein per meal because your body is going to break down the amino acid. And I think recently there's a paper that showed at a hundred grams of protein, there is actually an increase of 30% in protein synthesis. But in my opinion, increasing protein four times to get the 30% increase is not economical unless if you really need that protein synthesis for whatever recovery that you need for the next day that, you know, you, you have to like push it to really increase the protein synthesis. So in your experience and knowledge, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Um, all valid points. I think, so I typically, when I, when I'm meeting with somebody, I will typically baseline them at a specific number. And for that number is generally for me, I found very great results is 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Um, 
and like I said, I, I always baseline people to just see how their body responds to it. And then I make the adjustments from there. But generally speaking, that 1.2 grams per pound of body weight is, um, has worked very well for, for myself and my clients. So we'll, we'll start there. And then, you know, I do agree that protein should be spread out pretty evenly throughout the day, not even necessarily for an absorption rate, but more for um, just to constantly have a source of protein digesting in your body throughout that. Um, and you know how much people, you know, some people can take in 30 grams, you know, 30 grams uh, per meal. Some people can take in 50, some people can take in 80 and still absorb what they need to out of that. That's also very dependent. So that's a hard one for me to, to technically speak on because I, I don't have any proven science on, you know, that, well, you can only absorb this much uh, per each meal. So uh, because that is very dependent on on people, right? And there's reasons why like bodybuilders like Ronnie Coleman ate over 300 grams of protein a day. You can't you can't sit there and say that if he ate, you know, that he would only actually need 100 grams of protein a day to to maintain and continue to build the massive amount of muscle that this guy had, right? That just if he went to 100 grams of protein a day, it would not work for him, right? But 100 grams of protein a day would work for somebody who's only ingesting maybe 50 grams of protein per day. So those type of things, those are just all, you know, it's it's constant look of factors and where the person is and where they want to be. And it's, you know, honestly, a lot of, a lot of what fitness is and a lot of what programming is, is starting off with something and seeing how a person responds and making the adjustments as we go. Yeah, I think that's definitely very important. The dialing up or down the adaptation process. Um, it's the, like, why wouldn't we use the feedback system when it's there? Right, how, how strong we feel, how how good we feel versus how bad we feel given X amount of um, macronutrients. Um, what are the, the the best protein sources that you would recommend? I am a I'm I'm a big um, and I'm a, I'm an advocate for eating you know whole sources of food from from animal protein, beef, chicken, fish eggs, milk, whatever. I, I do that myself. And I strongly believe it though, that those are some of the best sources of protein. I'll give you for myself, for example, uh, I do steak very often. I do ground beef very often. I do chicken very often. Um, those are probably meat wise. Those are probably my main go-tos. Uh, but I also do, I personally, just because of how crammed my schedule is it's very convenient for me to do protein shakes quite often and so i'll do a few different kinds um you know i I have a plant-based protein so i'm going off topic and i'll come back on the topic i years ago i did a food sensitivity test and this I, i think everybody should do a food sensitivity test because if you eat a lot of the same stuff over time your body becomes sensitive to things and and then won't quite respond to it, right? So when we're talking about how much protein can one person absorb, well, if that person has an intolerance to uh, chicken or a sensitivity to chicken and they don't to beef, well, then beef would be a better option for them because their body's sensitive to chicken and is actually not going to digest and absorb what it could out of that, right? So going back to my, my, I had a sensitivity to um, whey protein, and it was really strange. I actually had, I had a lot of inflammation in my knees um, when this was going on. And I, I tried a number of different things. You know, I did acupuncture, cupping, massage therapy, all this kind of stuff, rehab to, to see what was going on with my knees. And then I did the food sensitivity test. Whey was one of the, my highest markers as far as highest sensitivities go. And so I took out whey protein and uh, not even five days later, the knee pain was just gone. It was, it was kind of wild. And so at that point in time, I had switched to a plant-based protein powder and um, that worked really great for me. And I retested that since then. And so, and, and I have the, the my sensitivity to whey has gone down. So I've now thrown in, um, I do hundred percent grass fed whey protein powder. Um, but those are super just convenient for, for me during the day. Like I, I'm not going to, I don't plug away six solid meals a day, like I did back when I was bodybuilding. So, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm also a man of convenience. I like things that are just kind of, you know, what, whatever makes my day more efficient, 
So if I don't have to actually sit down and eat a meal while I have all this other stuff to do, if I can make a protein shake and drink that, I, I will just do it. So, um, so going back, so main protein sources, I, I would always, always, always recommend that people do, you know, animal protein sources, protein powders. If you can't get all the, you know, sit down and do meals, all that kind of stuff, protein powders, super, super efficient, easy way to just get that protein number. In. And, you know, I think a lot of people struggle to get a high amount of protein, right? When most people, when I deal with people and I'm like, I just want you to track your food. Just, I just want to see what you're doing on a daily basis. Don't change anything. Don't do anything different. Just track what you normally do. And they, and then when I show them, okay, you actually need to be eating double this amount of protein. And then people are like, I don't know how to do that. Right. So protein shakes, they're just so easy. They don't, they don't make you feel super full or anything like that. But if you can, you know, get 40 grams of protein in, in a quick drink, that's, that's a game changer. It's a no brainer. Yeah, no, that's the thing, right? Because protein is feel, filling, like whole foods, like meat are, are going to be filling. And a lot of people just struggle to have that much food in during the day. And they don't realize how little protein they are consuming um, versus, you know, their goal. And, and when myself included, I've made that mistake myself when, I tried, I'm like, okay, I want to lose weight, but I still want to build muscle. But I ended up having too much of a calorie deficit and certainly under eating protein. And as a result, I wasn't getting anywhere. I was losing both muscle and fat at the same time. And then I go to the gym, I build it, you know, and then I lose it back. It's just a, a, a very bad cycle of not getting progress. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's tough. And that's where the exploration of all that comes in, right? Like, okay, well, where do I actually need to be, you know? And, and a lot of times people do a lot of stuff to lose weight, lose fat, and they under eat on protein. We bump up their protein, boom, suddenly they're losing fat, right? Of course the opposite, right? With people are trying to put on muscle and they're under eating on protein, they're just not going to build muscle. So, you know, you increase that, boom, they start building muscle. So I think protein is just solely the most important thing that people need to focus on. Yeah. All right. While we're on the topic of nutrition, what are the supplements that you would recommend for, you know, better training, like for energy, for better pro uh, protein synthesis or for better muscle building um, and for fat loss? Yeah. Um, so a protein powder, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is always a good supplement to, to implement. Um, I used to be really big into like, I need the best pre-workout and all that kind of stuff. And then, and I, I stopped doing pre-workouts. Um, I did now years ago, I went just straight keto and and this is when I was fitness modeling. So it kept me like super just shredded year round. Um, but I did notice a uh, kind of a drop off in just my energy and efficiency with my weight training sessions because of not having the carbs in there. But I did notice that my just my energy through the day felt great and my mental focus was great. And so, um, so while I'm a big fan of what ketosis can do. I'm also, I also know what, what the importance of like what carbs can do for my training. And, and, and especially as I got into the endurance training and everything, right? Like the, just the importance of having the two. So being able to have the carb energy and the, um, you know, the energy of, of ketosis of ketones was, was huge for me. And so that's why I was stoked with, uh, with ketone IQ and HVMN because, you know, just having the, those exogenous ketones just to be able to plug right down there and still feel that same just flow state energy and mental focus from that was huge for me because that way I can balance the two. I get the carbs in. Actually, I made a video um, a, a little while ago about dual fueling for for endurance runs using using carbohydrate sources and ketone sources as well. So that is definitely one of my go-tos and one of my favorites. I also think a super important one for people is electrolytes. I think very, people are, I, I think most people are overall dehydrated and you know, it's funny because you can actually be dehydrated even though you're just drinking water, right? Because drinking water doesn't automatically just make you hydrated. You have to have those electrolytes 
in that balance because if you're just drinking water and then you're continuing to you know go to the bathroom throughout the day well you're still excreting electrolytes from your body through that and so if you're not replacing those then you still end up dehydrated to begin with and your energy sucks and you know your mood sucks all that kind of stuff so electrolytes huge huge um supplement that i think everybody needs to be adding in um and when we talk about recovery and performance and and i kind of split my what i view on supplements into like does this help my recovery or does this help my performance and uh creatine hands down is is like a must a have to have i think for anyone who's looking to just really increase their performance their strength their body composition their cog you know the the their cognitivity in their brain their recovery creatine you know is the, is pro- is the most researched and proven supplement on the market so i think everybody male female whatever age you know well obviously not little little babies but you know at, a, at any age where somebody is performing in activities or whatever i think creatine is a must have and then um big fan of adding in you know like vitamin wise uh, digestive enzymes probiotics prebiotics all the stuff that's going to be healthy for your gut because if your gut is not healthy then the amount of food that you're intaking, like you're not going to absorb everything. You're not going to digest things properly, all that kind of stuff. So you got to make sure your gut is healthy. And then um, huge fan of magnesium. And I take magnesium at night. That for me is a major part of my recovery um, and vitamin D. What form of magnesium? Um, so I take it's um, from Bioptimize and it has, um, it actually has three different kinds. Um, And I am Mm. drawing a blank on those at the top of my head. Um, But um, that the major improvement that that has made just on my my sleep and recovery, I can all I can tell an an improvement. Like if there's ever a point in time where I don't where I like if if I travel and I forget my magnesium or anything like that, um, I can tell the difference in my sleep and just in the the um, if it or the uh, quality of my sleep, I should say. So magnesium, definitely a big one that I think people should add in more. Um, as far as supplements go, I mean, I, that's a lot of what I do. Um, the, you know, vitamins and all that kind of stuff are good. But as far as adding in those other types of supplements, those, that's primarily what I'm adding into my thing. And what I think I think most people, every, everybody can can actually benefit from. Yeah, I can definitely attest to what you ex- described with the keto diet. I have experienced exactly the same feeling. Um, I tried it for like two, three months and it, you know, I feel great during the day. I feel productive. I feel cognitively dialed in. But if I lift heavy, it, it just the fatigue kicks, kicks in much quicker. Like when you are doing a heavy, say, bench and you know from like your max is eight, and going from the seven to eight or eight to nine rep, you just suddenly literally do not have strength left. That's how I felt when I was on a, uh, on a keto diet. So, um, so thanks for, you know, reaffirming that. Um, in terms of training, so I'm not referring to endurance athletes or bodybuilders. So, so those are extremes. Let's say a, a casual gym goer, someone who works out regularly, what sort of ratio would you recommend when it comes to endurance versus strength training? Like how many days should they lift weights? How many days should they do their cardio? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think strength training is the priority, in my opinion. I, I think mm-hmm. there's a ton of benefits that come from just what you get from just strictly strength training. So I would say for your average gym goer, if you are doing strength training, I would say at a bare minimum, three days a week, um, ideally more of the four to five days a week, but bare minimum three days a week. And then the cardio, depending on, you know, if this person is trying to lose weight or how much weight or whatever, I would say the cardio, you know, two to three days a week uh, is probably a sweet spot to start with. And then, and then of course you adjust from there. Mm-hmm. But I, w- I would say I, I 100% always think the strength training is the priority. And I think that's a... I think when people think about losing weight, they automatically jump to, I need to go start doing cardio. But, um, 
you know, which cardio is great for burning calories. But, you know, when we think of long term, what the benefits of lean muscle mass do and the and strength training do when it comes to fat loss, when it comes to joint health and, and you know, skeletal muscle and all that kind of stuff, there's there's just nothing that can beat that. Yeah, fair enough. So and also, since you are one of our Kichonaku athletes, I have to ask, you know, um, can you describe how you feel where when you're on Keto IQ? That's the first question. And the second question is, what are the use cases of Keto IQ um, to you useful? Um, repeat the first question. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Let me let me let me put that around. Like, what do you use Keto IQ for? And then how do you feel when you're on Keto IQ? How do you feel? Yeah. Um, I, the best way when I explain to people what ketone IQ makes you feel like is, is I say flow state energy and you know, I, it's, it's a very calming and, and calm energy sounds contradictive, but that's exactly what I feel like. Like, I feel like I can just go and I don't feel any up and down, you know, I just, I just feel super steady. And then, and my mental focus is just very much on point when I do that. So ketone IQ for me works best on, I feel works best on any of my endurance things. So all my runs, bike, swimming, actually, actually what I like literally all that I fueled with for my triathlon. Um, and it was important for me. The swimming was very difficult for me um, because I, I don't float, I sink. And so I have to work much harder in the water than Just dense muscle. <laughs> yeah. So I have to work much harder in the water than a lot of people do, which makes my heart rate increase. And, you know, on those endurance races, you want to try to keep, you want to try to keep a zone two heart rate on a lot of that. So I was stoked that ketone IQ gave me that just very steady energy to be able to do, but, but, you know, since it's not a caffeine energy, it doesn't increase my heart rate, which was which was just life-saving for me to be able to have that that just steady flow state of energy and just feel good and be able to keep going and not have to worry about that caffeine up and down. So most of the time, um, the ketone IQ, I also do just keto, ketone IQ just in the morning. And especially if there's ever, ever mornings where I wake up feeling a little groggy or whatever, I'll take a shot of the ketone IQ and it just kind of just gets me there, right? Prepared for my day. But I love the benefit of it for my endurance um, work my runs, you know, and I'll always take one prior to, and then depending on how long of about I'm going for, you know, if I'm going for a two, uh, you know, a two hour run or whatever it is, then taking one or even two of those sometimes space throughout that to just keep me going. Um, I've found to be most efficient for me. And that's just really when I noticed the benefits of it. So either, either while I'm doing my endurance work or, you know, if I just need my, my brain to be there or, you know, like if I'm, if I need to sit down on my laptop and bang out like four hours of work and just be focused and present there, I'll do the ketone IQ right before I do that as well. Cause that again, just puts me in a, just a very focused state of mind. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, have you ever noticed that, um, your heart rate actually decreased when you're on ketone IQ? Cause I've got some anecdotal um, cases where they feel like they work out at the same intensity, but when they're on ketone IQ, their heart rate is actually lower than they would um, otherwise. So I have noticed that on my runs because there's definitely been times where I've taken ketone IQ before a run and there's times where I've gone on runs without taking because I do myself, I like to see, you know, I, I also believe in the placebo effect. I, I believe that sometimes you can take something and if you believe that it's actually working, it works. So I, everything, that I do with the brands that I partner with, I, sh I make sure that I do things with it and then I do things without it so that I can, and, and multiple times of doing that, right? Not just like, oh, this one day, you know, I might've just been feeling good that day or I might've just been feeling bad that day or whatever. So multiple times yeah. that I have done this and um, with the ketone IQ before or not before my runs and I, um, I, I and this was actually just, it was either last week or the week before, had a uh, run that I was doing where, um, and I tried, I tried to uh, do all my, my, like my treadmill work, you know, like I, with my training program that I have for this half marathon coming up, I have set paces that I need to do. So my paces stay steady when I'm doing my zone two work, it's all at the same pace. I try to keep that in mind when I'm like mm -hmm. 
you know, working on things, right? So if I taking ketone IQ on one run and then not taking it on another one, I need to make sure that those runs are the same run, right? Same distance or sorry, uh, right. same time frame and same pace, right? So we need to keep things as simple as possible or as close to um, same as possible. And so it was just the other week where I did um, just one of my zone two runs, 45 minutes. And uh, it was the first time that at that same pace, I was able to keep my heart rate um, actually below a 140 for the first time. And that was with taking the ketone IQ. And I have noticed when I don't take it, my heart rate um, starts off pretty steady. But as I progress through the run, it go even if I'm keeping the same pace, it will start to climb. Uh, it creeps up. Yes, it with me up, yeah. in the same pace. And I have noticed that when I do the ketone IQ, that does not happen. So yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with what you said about that. Yeah. Um, I've noticed sometimes myself and I try to, you know, do, do experiments with myself, but I, it, I haven't been able to replicate it hundred percent. I think there are like maybe five out of five times, like three times it works and then two, it doesn't, but I don't know what the variables are. So I'm still trying to like figure it, figure that out. So I think the best, best way to figure out is like, to you know, work with like athletes like you guys who track everything and and everything styled in and making it as consistent as possible, and then being able to really um, single out the, the the variable that is causing that. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know that's that's a lot of variable to keep up with, right? And that's why like it's it's great when you have like those those studies that show like because that's what they do. They keep everything consistent and try to keep everything as similar as possible in order to just see the efficiency of just this factor being put in. So that's super important. And, uh, and like I said, yeah. that's why when I test things out, I'm, I, I try to keep as much the same as possible given, you know, it, was it a stressful day? Or was it a not stressful day? Did I get eight hours of sleep? Did I get six hours of sleep? Right. There's only so much you can fully, fully control, but yeah. I, I would say in, in a grand scheme of things from what I've seen with it, it most definitely uh, helps with that. All right, cool. Um, Tyler, has been a, it has been a great conversation. Thank you very much for coming on. For our audience who would love to know more and follow more around you know, the knowledge that you spread to the world, where can they find you? Can you please share with us? Yes, Instagram is definitely my number one. Uh, my handle for that is at tholt21 underscore. <clears throat> um, that's, and everything else is linked to, to the Instagram, but that is what I am using uh, mostly. So, uh, and I try to try to be super responsive to everybody. I try to help anyone who messages me or has questions or anything like that. I was, you know, once a, once a person asking, asking everybody else for, for help and picking people's brains and all that kind of stuff. So I, I definitely try to give back on that. So would love to hear from you guys and speak with you guys and have conversations. And, um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been a blast and that we it's strange, like you said at the beginning it's yeah, weird that we're, we're just now meeting but i'm, I'm glad we did <laughs> yeah same here thank you so much awesome